The following announcement has been paid for by the Mark Order. Welcome to the Elite Mark Order podcast number 21, where we review the March 3rd, 2023 edition of AEW Dynamite over on TBS. I'm Cosmic Scott of the Elite Mark Order. With me tonight is Krillin. JV is out. He's not feeling well. What's up? How are you doing tonight, Krill? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? All right. I'm doing fantastic. Glad to hear it. Um, yep. Remember, if you want to join in on the co- the conversation, you can join us in the Discord. Link is in the comment down below or in the uh, description. You can also go to EliteMarkOrder.com. Join, uh, click on Join the Discord there. And we definitely want to hear your comments. So tell us down below what you thought was the spot of the night. And that's where we're going to start tonight is the spot of the night. And don't forget, if you join the Discord, the password, JJ for life. Or NBAK. Yes, that is also totally acceptable. Never bet against Cuba. Cuba, you mean Cuba. Uh, Cuba did one uh, in the other Discord, uh, the games Discord. Uh, where he, he got something right. So it's like, never bet against Cuba. So I figured I'd throw that one in there. Uh, I knew you were going to go for it. But no, a, never bet against Krillin. Yes, I had to had to use it uh, because we know you are often right. Though you are probably the youngest member of our Discord, you seem to have a, a fairly good knowledge and an extensive knowledge of the history of wrestling. So we love having you around. You're a great, I won't call you backup. I'll call you an alternate uh, you fill in whenever we need you, and we're glad to have you around. So thanks for joining. Thank you, sir. I just raised my water up like it's uh, <laughs> like it's bottle. a drink. There you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the spot, right. the spot of the week. I'm going to go ahead and and move on. Uh, the spot of the week we're going to talk tonight is the absolute brilliant counter that MJF had to Darby's Code Red that was immediately following a Code Red he hit on Sammy. Now I know that Krillin, uh, we talked before. You agree. What was it about that code red that really struck you as the spot of the week? Because it's not something you're expecting. You don't expect somebody to just like hold them off like that. Just like stop them from completely hitting the code red and then just flip them into a sit out power bomb. And that was unique. It was something that, you know, again, we've said this before. Before the podcast started, we were like, yeah, it has not really been done as far as we've seen. Maybe it's been done before. We're not entirely sure. But I definitely think it was a unique counter. Nobody else has done it, as far as we both know. But MJF was the first one to do it on live TV, and he did it perfectly. And and that's really what it comes down to, is I've been watching wrestling for a long, long time. I haven't watched a lot of WWE in the last few years uh, because they turned me off, but I keep up with it. I know Simon Miller does a great job of, of recapping. And when a Code Red is hit, if it were countered, people would be talking about it. Now, they didn't talk a huge amount about it with MJF last night uh, because he's got so much other shit going on. It was just another great move in a series of of great moves in the match overall, which we will cover immediately following the spot of the night. But for those who don't know what a code red is, is the MJF, as an example, stands there. Darby jumps over him, over his head, lands sort of a sunset flip style, And MJF does a backwards flip, lands on his head, and it looks really damned impressive. He lands between Darby's legs and uh, bounces off his head, sort of like a DDT. Now, in this case, Max put the brakes on, and he stopped. And you can't do this if a person is heavier, but the way that the code red comes off, it's really a lot of teamwork. And so because Darby was so small, he put the brakes on, and turned it, as you said, uh, Krill, right into a power bomb and i do believe and please if somebody knows otherwise tell us in the comments this is the first time i've seen it on television at least in the last 20 years at least in the last 10 years since the code red has really been invented and popularized that's a hell of a counter and that's why it deserves the spot of the week now the rest of the match itself was also a tremendous amount of fun because as always Darby was throwing himself around. As always, you know, uh, Jack Perry was doing the athletic moves, was trying to get people into the snare trap. There was a sequence at one point where he had uh, Sammy on one side and he had 
MJF on the other side, and he dove and hit Sammy on one. Got in the ring, ran across, dove and hit MJF on the other. Did that basically twice for each of the guys until he exhausted himself. It was and then a- Darby Allen shot out like a fucking cannon. <laughs> Right at Sammy Guevara and knocked him in the barricade. Just let's see what yeah. he does. Yeah. One of the best suicide dives, one of the best Tope Suicidas. Quote me on this one. One of the best Tope Suicidas in the business today. Because yeah. he just gets so much momentum and he hits you out of fucking nowhere and he goes right in the bottom rope. All of a sudden you see Darby Allen right, him, right at you. Yeah, he, he literally he takes the suicida part very literal. And he does have the best one in the game because he literally does not care about his body and he throws himself bodily full force into people i think it's freaking crazy but it is amazing and right after jungle boy jack perry got his pops and sammy was staggering around on the other side you're right darby threw himself at sammy and got his own pop sort of overshadowing what jack was doing and that played right into the finish because as we knew it was going to lead into the four-way dance at double or nothing and it did but the finishing sequence was interesting because jack ended up hitting his sliding uh clothesline to the back of the head on sammy and he was going for the pin but what he didn't see was the blind tag from darby so darby gets up hits the coffin drop Jack Perry sees it out of the corner of his eye, rolls out, hits the coffin drop directly on Sammy, into the pin, gets the pin. Jack is pissed off. Darby is now strutting around, king of the ring, cock with the walk. He wins the match. He outshines Jack Perry a couple of times in the in the match. And overall, in the build, I think Darby has been much more successful at being at that same level as Max. Sammy's close, and and unfortunately, way, way in back is Jack Perry because his promos are not as good as the other three. Well, he's definitely going to be working on those big time, and I know we're going a little bit out of order here, but I want to cover Wardlow's match with Logan Luro. I do believe that is his name from last night, and yeah. one of the first things he hit, they locked up, and then Wardlow picked him up in the air and hit him with a gorilla press spine buster there is only one other person i can think of that has done that move so much and it's goldberg so yeah. was that an allusion to wwe hall of famer goldberg is it possible that we could be seeing goldberg versus wardlow at all in that would be a big match for wardlow if he beats goldberg then that will launch him into the main event that should launch him into the main event because that's a fucking hall of famer goldberg is a beast wardlow is a beast you need both of them to be in a match. I mean, yeah, I know, granted, you know, Wardlow still needs a lot of work. Goldberg's old, uh, is up there in age, and, you know, last time he had, like, a big match like that, you know, he dropped Undertaker on his head. But also, again, that was against a guy that, you know, is old. Undertaker is old, just like Goldberg, and Taker's got a fucked up wheel as it is. And So you can't really expect anything to come to be good out of it. And it was in Saudi Arabia, so they had jet lag. And it was like 120 degrees. I live in the desert. It will sap you even if you're in air conditioning all day. And Goldberg also had a fucking concussion because he decided to bash his head against the fucking door before he came out and ended up bleeding. Because he thought he was still in his 30s and it was WCW and that shit was okay. Right. But anyway, yeah, he he uh, that's that's something we can talk about when Wardlow comes back up in the show. Uh, But absolutely, as far as the MJF, uh, Sammy saga continues i think uh darby has shined the most i think sammy is is again very close to it and then uh jack perry does need work he needs to work on his promos uh his in-ring work is great i think he can tell a story with his wrestling and i think he needs a little bit of work Uh, i think sammy's right there i know jericho's been working with him um and you know darby has sting so I think that, uh, you know, maybe somebody needs a bit of a mentor. Maybe maybe somebody right. needs to take take poor Jack Perry under his wing and teach him how to talk. I know they did that with Christian, and it doesn't seem to have worked. Right. So maybe, maybe we can see that in the future. But 
maybe if Edge does actually come over, because there's also that rumor yep. there too. Yep. Maybe Edge can take him underneath his wing for a little bit. You know, it, it would be Edge interesting. Get him over by hugging him. Yeah, well, it would be interesting to have the the sort of Christian dynamic with Edge in the same uh, promotion again. Because Christian's positively a heel with Luchasaurus. If Edge came in, you know, to, to be the backup for somebody like Jack Perry, I think that would be interesting. I think that would be really cool. Um, I think the reason why we can talk about people like Goldberg and Edge coming in and be positive about it is the way AEW is using their legends. And they've shown not only do they have respect for them, but they're going to use them in appropriate ways. They just brought Arn back. They've been using Sting. They they recreated, they rehabbed his career as a 60-year-old. Jumping off shit. Jumping off balconies. Jumping off tables. He and is... And looking good. And looking amazing for it. So, you know, totally rehabbed his entire image. Uh, you know, Arn, everybody else, Jake the Snake. They've treated every... Billy Gunn is the same age Daddy basically. Ass. you Daddy know ass. he's still getting pushed because he looks amazing and can move and yeah he doesn't have to sell because everybody looks like a midget because he came from the land of giants he's a big dude so i love it um all right let's Go move ahead it. And cover hey now first hey now hey now i'm running the show this is my circus my monkeys <laughs> back off Thank you. All right. Let's move on, though. You are right. Uh, the first match of the night that opened the show, of course, with the the beautiful rendition of Jane from Jefferson Starship, is an Orange Cassidy match. In this case, the the eight man tag team match. It was huge. One of the most thrown random fucking thrown together tag teams: Orange Cassidy, Bandito, Adam Cole, and the newest addition to AEW. Roger Strong, who this, came this, out of fucking nowhere last week and hit people with backbreakers and slammed them all over the place. And this was his debut, and it was against the 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 Jericho Asshole Society, uh, which was you mean the Dover Appreciation Society. Yeah, it was it was everybody except Jericho on the male side, and Jericho was on commentary. So it was Hagar, uh, the horrible uh, Daniel Garcia, Mark Menard, and Angelo Parker. So. Uh, it was a totally random four-way team, but Cole and Strong, obviously, they have that connection. That's why they wanted it. It's against Jericho. They needed the help. Somehow, randomly, Orange and Bandito became friends last week, and then they came out for the save against Cole. That's the part I don't get. So it makes sense, once they're friends and they came for the save, that they would then have the match this week. But why right. they originally came out last week, no clue. I will say, I don't know shit about Roderick Strong. I've never seen yeah, him work. I'm I'm getting to know more a lot about him. You know, people like Redheaded Kingpin, you know, our good buddy over yeah. here. He'd probably know a lot about him. Puba would probably know a lot about him. But I'm starting to get to know a little bit more about him because I wasn't really an NXT person. When I watched Roger NXT, was in NXT, I was already gone. Right, exactly. Uh, I never saw Adam Cole. I heard about him. I never saw the uh, Undisputed Era. By that point, I was out. I was out of, I was done. NXT had gone to shit. WWE was shit. I was done. So I never got to see Roderick Strong. I heard about him, obviously. Um, I'm getting to know him just like you are. And I have to say, they talked a lot about the Messiah of the Backbreaker or whatever it was. He put a lot of effort into his moves. He was intense. He was crisp. He actually looked like he was trying to get the match over. And I was glad to see it. It was actually enjoyable. Obviously, Orange Cassidy has a great match. His team mm -hmm. ends up with the win because not only is he a champion, but Adam Cole is, is, is actively feuding with the leader of the Jericho Appreciation Society. And so his henchmen here. aren't going to be up to the task. Right. And then here's where we get into the fun part. Chris mm -hmm. Jericho comes walking out with that new t-shirt, which you can buy on shopaw.com, oh. of Britt Baker with her black eye, which, again, you know, they made, and they were having the heels wear it. And that incensed Adam Cole... Adam Cole beat the fuck out of everyone. Actively during the match, he was trying to get up to Jericho. And then afterwards, 
He hightails it. As soon as he pins Matt Menard, he turns around, let's go, dashes out of the fucking ring, dashes up the stage, Jericho's still commentary. He knocks Jericho right through the fucking hand wall, <laughs> continues to pound on him. Jericho's sitting there screaming like a bitch, going, get him out of here, get him out of here, and all this other stuff. It was and great. Not the whole match. Jericho's just shit talking. Adam Cole's saying, you know, hey, if that was me, I would have defended my lady. But Adam Cole's a dick. He's a dumbass. He didn't get up and, you know, help his lady. He was just sitting there watching it, the fuck beat out of her by the outcast. But yeah, this is all on him. And it was great. It adds more. And then later on, we saw them. Adam Cole's getting out of the fucking building. Britt Baker walks up, slap right across the face to Jericho. Jericho goes down and starts screaming like a bitch again. Jericho's selling every damn thing perfectly. Gotta always give credit to Chris Jericho. Despite his age, Jericho is delivering fantastic work no matter what. It's he true. shit on him all the time, but Jericho's a fucking great-ass worker and he never will be topped. The, the same people who are shitting on him also said that uh, 30,000 tickets sold were all scalpers. So we won't go into that now, will we? The fact, nope. the fact of the matter is, this was a good match for Adam Cole. Made him look strong. He got the finish with the boom. Uh, of course, it was against one of the jobbers. It doesn't matter. Jericho's entire job squad was out. The only person of interest is now Sammy because Daniel Garcia's fallen back down in with those guys. Um, and the other three, Hagar, Menard, and, and uh, Parker. Shit, Menard can't even keep a job as an announcer at this point. So th those three, they're the lowest of the low. Daniel Garcia could be a really big name, and he just isn't, but he could be. Um, and, of course, Jericho. So, yeah, absolutely. I think Adam Cole played it smart. He was a smart face. He was absolutely motivated. He crushed the opponents. He got the finish, immediately sprinted up the ramp, took out Jericho. I thought it was a great segment, made Adam Cole look really strong. He Agreed. eventually got pulled off by security and thrown out of the building. And once he was thrown out of the building, that was the encounter that he had with uh, with Britt Dr. Baker. Dr. Britt Baker, yeah. DMD, which, you know, we always have to say because you do she every week. Absolutely. And she All right. she did look a little stronger. I do have to say something about the T-shirt. Right. Go ahead. If they had put it in context, there are other T-shirts where they're bloody and they're, you know, it looks like they're in their ring attire or in the ring. Totally different. Because this is Britt Baker, hair down, looks like she's in her living room, it's just her and the black eye. People thought that it was domestic abuse because there was nothing to convey wrestling. Right. That, I think, exactly. was the big problem with the shirt overall. I yeah, get what they're doing. if you go out in public, if you go out in public with that t-shirt on, and you know, nobody knows who, Doc a lot of people are still just starting to get to learn who Dr. Britt Baker is. And they see that t-shirt, they're going to think, holy shit, wait a minute, you're supporting domestic violence. It's, Who it's, the hell is that woman? It's, it, it, the image itself is not conveying the message correctly. And I get right. why the heels did it, and it makes perfect sense. But because of the framing, and it's just her with the half the, 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 the face, the hair in front of the face is something that domestic abuse survivors do it yeah. i i i i've got a degree in psychology i understand what the image the impact it was having on people who've actively been abused and so that's the only reason i have a problem with the shirt is because it didn't have context because right. there's uh, like more context then mm -hmm. it would be better they well bit. as an example they had uh, Britt Baker with the bloody face in her ring gear, and it sort of looked like she was in the ring. You could tell she was in a fight as opposed to a girl with a black eye. Right. So, if, like, they had, like, her, like, laying in the ring, like, you know, they did, like, a shot of her just, like, laying in the ring. That would have been different. You right. Gotten, okay, right. Yeah, hey, she just got the fuck beat out of her by somebody. You know, but the, instead, the, it's just a selfie they use. Again, it wasn't even the selfie. It was, it was the framing of the selfie. It was the fact that it was her. It was in a living room. It was her in a hoodie. There was no key that this was the result of her being in a fight and her being a badass, getting her ass whooped by three women when her, you know, the love of her life was inches away and couldn't do anything. That story wasn't told in that picture. 
and yep. that was the shortcoming of the show. All right. So let's move on, and Do let's move to Soraya versus Willow Nightingale. Well, uh, you did forget. All right. Yeah. The uh, the backstage interview with Darby Allen and Jungle Boy. Correct. And they looked like they were on the same page. Darby Allen again had that sort of presence on the mic that that was glaringly missing from Perry. And he ended with it's showtime and the crowd responded. I was like, wow, that came across really well. So Darby shined versus he outshined Jack Perry yep. in every segment they were in together. So I think of that, I think when it comes down to that, I think the reason why, you know, Christian's teachings with jungle boy and Darby's teachings with sting, why it's not, comparables because i think with christian and jungle boy they were only really around each other you know on screen like maybe they went backstage maybe they talked like oh yeah hey you know what's up what's up hey hi whatever but with darby on and sting i have seen it multiple times darby on and sting have actually bonded. built a real yeah. connection they've really yeah, bonded I've seen yeah. pictures of them out in public somewhere like you know darby yeah. on's doing like his little shit and sting is there sitting right there with them he really took the mentorship uh for real yeah, exactly. I I think so, I think it, it went beyond kayfabe. I think Christian yeah. took him as sort of yeah. While we're here together, we can talk about stuff and sort of strategize. And Sting was like, "We're friends. I'm 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 exactly. showing up to your shit because you're cool, dude. I'm here to support you." Yeah, and exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it shows in the development that Darby has had versus uh, Jack Perry. Because he talks thing. I mean, I'm looking at his Instagram right now, and this is from this was a post from November 2022. And for his hoodlum uh, line that he has, Sting is modeling one of the T-shirts. Sting mm -hmm. is standing in the middle of the field. He's in front of barbed wire, mm -hmm. and he has his baseball bat, and he has on a hoodlum T-shirt. Yeah, he fully supported him. He's it's not Kate. It's not fake. That's the point. And exactly. that that's that's what you're saying. I totally agree, and I think that absolutely is reflected on screen in the confidence Darby has versus Jack, who's still trying to get used to stuff. I, yeah. I, I think they've absolutely shown that when the pairing works, it works real well. Now, exactly. what's funny is we've already covered the next segment, which was Adam Cole being ejected and Britt Baker coming up and slapping him. So we're, we're moving through this at a good clip. Finally. I think the two-person format's working, uh, <laughs> as as opposed to three where right. it's chaos. Yeah, um, exactly. But one of my favorite parts of the show was the backstage promo with the Blackpool Combat Club, where Brian right. Danielson not only said he was better than Bret Hart, and Bret Hart's catchphrase sucked, and Bret Hart wasn't the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. So you know when they do their Canadian uh, jaunt here coming yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that tournament, he's going to get so much heat on them for that. And he already has heat because there are people sitting there screaming on social media, there are more wrestlers that are better than Brian Danielson. Brian course. Danielson fucking sucks. It's like, he's no. Brian Danielson He's got heel heat last night, you dumbasses. He is Please. brilliant. I love Brian Danielson. I Guy's have for years. He's been wrestling since 1999, so he knows what the hell he's doing. He's a vet at this point. He's a student of the game. He knows how to get heel heat. He knows yeah. how to get fans to hate yeah. him, how to get fans to love him. It works perfectly. He, He's a consummate wrestler. As the you mouthpiece. Can't find anybody else. He he really he has the entire package. He really is a complete wrestler. And and it absolutely was not hyperbole when William Regal kept saying if you built a perfect wrestler, it would be Daniel Bryan because or Brian exactly. Danielson. Because he may not be the tallest, but he can move anybody. He can get yeah, anybody. He can have a great match with Andre the fucking Giant in his late hey. years when he was nothing but a moving immobile tree trunk. All the, right. Correction. Let me, let me, not really correction, but more so. He could have a fucking great match with Giant Gonzalez of all people. The Yeti. Hey. Gonzalez. Yeah. The Yeti. Hey. <laughs> All those people. He can have a great match with early day yeah. uh, Nidia. With Nidia, you know, after Tough Enough. He, he he really could. He could have a great match with Moppy. Yeah. Or so, with uh, Mitch, the pot of plant. All right. Exactly. On That's the point. The no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Let's talk about right, this. Because right. this is Brian Danielson. And it is him talking about how good everybody is. He talked about the little shit 
Wheeler Yuta. The fact is, he, he's like, I, you, know, you could see there was a little animosity, but he likes him. He's the young guy, so they pick on him a little bit. But right. the the entire promo and the next part with Moxley when he started talking about leaving a scar, and, and both the two of them, I don't know anybody on the entire roster who's better. I really don't. Nope. You could say equal. Nobody. You could say equal. There are people who are equal to these guys, like MJF. Exactly. But you cannot or say anybody's Omega. better. Omega's another good example. Don Callis. There's a, there's a, there's a few of them. You cannot say they're better. These nope. guys are the top of the card, and that's why them not being involved in the world title, or the tag title, or the trios title, or any titles except ROH at this point, which is totally acceptable. Because mm -hmm. Claudio's like, yeah, of course I'm the champion of ROH. Those guys, they got nothing on me. You know, their entire persona has gotten so much better since Daniel Bryan has, or since Bryan Danielson has taken over as the mouthpiece. And that's, I still, I love the fact that he is the Damocles sword hanging over their matches. Because if he gets involved, who's going to be better than him? Nobody. When he gets involved, that's the best in the fucking world. Or should I say the best wrestler in the world? Because that's his shit. Right. Yep. But And Moxley hyped up their his match with Kenny Omega yeah, next week. And yeah. Steel Cage perfectly. Mentioning their history. All yep. the matches they've had. Yep. You know, 2019, 2020, a little bit in 2021. And now here we are again. It's going to be a go great match. Steel Cage it's going to be Moxley fantastic. To leave a scar on his head. There, there's going to be, a, I mean, it's a cage match. You know there's going to be gonna blood. Be you know it's going to be bloody with Moxley. If it's Moxley, yeah, I was going to say, if it's Moxley, Moxley's going to be, you know. Moxley in a cage. If he doesn't bleed, Omega will. Exactly. So, personally, okay. I'm hyped for it. You know we're all and marks you're... for the elite. We are the elite mark order. Remember, elitemarkorder.com. Join us in the Discord. Yep. Tell us in the comments how much you love the elite. Um, so, we're all marks for them. But I'm also a big mark for the BCC, and I'm not going to kid you on that. So I'm just really hyped. This is a great trio set. They can have multiple different types of matches. doesn't have to just be three-on-three. Three. And I exactly. think this next one-on-one -on -one is the epitome of what this rivalry between the two top factions could really be. Right. Now, right. is there anything else you want to add in? Because I know I've been interrupting you continuously with everything else. I'm leaving out some shit. You keep You're trying to move on past segments, man. Come on. Give me... No. Um, <laughs> the next segment is... I won't say the best, but it is the woman's segment. Uh, and it, it included everybody you would imagine who's at the top of the woman's card. It was Soraya versus Willow Nightingale. Now, and Soraya still looks like shit. She looked better. And Willow Nightingale carried her. I want to exactly. know why none of Willow's friends came out. You know the out... Uh, not, uh, not outsiders. You know those women... I forget what they are. The the, the outcasts. Outcasts. That's, yeah. I'm always going to think outsiders, there. though. I'm always going to think outsiders. Old head mind right there. Old what can I say? Mind. NWO for life. Um, for, for, for life. <laughs> exactly. Hey, yo. Uh, seriously, my NWO friend, we still say hey, yo to each other. That's Toothless Hogan, by the way. Hey, yo. Um, the fact is, Willow carried Soraya. But where were her friends? Sure, Sheeta came out later for the save, and it was great. It was a big surprise. They did the big turn, and then, you know, first she was going to join them, then she turned on them. And then, you know, Hater and, and Britt Baker came from behind and they got some revenge on them and it was great. But where were they during the match so Willow could win? I honestly don't know. That's one of the things I have to say I hate with AEW. Is it, I hate with all wrestling. It makes no fucking sense. Why is it that the heels are always allowed to have like about fucking 9,000 yeah. people in their corner, but the babyface has to stand there going... It's classic. My, my people are invisible. It's classic. My are invisible. It's classic wrestling logic. I don't agree with it, but it happens everywhere. I would like to see smarter faces. 
a lot of the times the faces are stuck carrying the idiot ball just so that the heels can get away with their shit. The refs exactly. are the worst. The refs are the absolute worst. They own the idiot ball. And if they weren't easily distracted, it wouldn't be as entertaining. Right. So the, you have to explain why the refs miss shit all the time. Then they look like garbage. Otherwise, people complain the refs just let them go and do anything. What are the? There's no rules, so there's always a complaint. Uh, it's just the way nobody's it is. Nobody's ever happy. Nobody's ever happy. So, no, I don't like the fact that Willow didn't bring out her friends, but it gave Sheeta the chance for the big pop, the big turn. They got to have their big spray paint moment. The heels still got the win, so they looked strong. The faces got their heat back. They got the big reveal. It's a mid segment still. These are the top I mean, of the card, and it's it's mid. It's mid, but I mean, it was a great swerve because I honestly thought when she walked out, I was like, okay, let me guess, she's gonna join them, isn't she? And then you know she did. I called and it. And then all of a sudden, they came out of nowhere. Soraya, not Soraya, uh, Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter showed up out of nowhere and they attacked them. I was like, oh, okay, damn. My dad turned around, was outside, came in briefly. It's like, oh shit, she had turned. And then he came right back. He's like, okay, never mind. And I was like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing too. It was a good turn. I, I believe everybody was taken in by it because I called it. I was like, oh, she, she's going to turn. My wife's like, oh, you totally called it, didn't you? I was like, yeah. Oh, wait. So it, it was, it was, everybody thought she was going to turn and join. And then she did. And then she turned again. And I think that the second turn was actually good. I think it took the segment and, and gave, yeah, exactly. It was well done. I think it gave the segment a little bit of that energy that it needed other than just her return. But I still think overall this feud is going nowhere and I'm starting to get bored again. So hopefully we can do something. Hopefully here's my thing. Mercedes, if they're just yeah, holding out for Mercedes, you know, here's the thing, Tony, if this is true, he really, he's going to have to learn to adjust. If they're waiting for, for Chris Statlander for the TBS title, it's gone on way too long. If they're waiting for Mercedes for this stupid outcast plot to continue, it's starting to get too long. Sometimes you just got to turn. Exactly. Do something different. Go because we different cannot keep direction. on watching uh, Britt Baker feud with like about half the women that come over from WWE and just go, Holy shit, or, you know, them just getting outsmarted because, wait, baby faces are stupid. Baby faces are like the epitome of stupidity. Sometimes. It's getting old. It yeah. is. Sometimes they have a brain. Sometimes they have, like, an IQ of negative uh, 1,000. I just, it's like Willow. I'm tired of her looking dumb. I think she's a great talent. I love her. She's got great energy. She's good in the ring. I saw her come up from dark at elevation. Now here she is on dynamite constantly. She's mm -hmm. moving up. She's had some wins. She's been, you know, she started to get showcased. I know she's about to break through because the fans love her. She is still in ROH picking up wins. So right. she's one of those breakthrough characters. That's technically working at the top of the card, taking the loss similar to sky blue, but looking good while doing it. But instead of being against somebody like Tony Storm, where she can look good, or Ruby Soho, where at least she won't look bad, she, she was has a, to be against Soraya. Where she has to carry Soraya and make Soraya look good. So that reflects better on Willow. Yeah. That's and more not... responsibility for the match. Yeah. And we've discussed this many times. It's getting sad to see Soraya be carried because Soraya's <sighs> a pet. She was and, great. You know, she was. Yeah. When she started, I fucking loved her. I thought she was amazing. AJ. Same. When AJ came out, their feud was epic. I was so jealous of CM Punk. I uh, Soraya herself, until she got hurt, I thought was just this up-and-coming prodigy almost. And, right. You know, her, her entire trajectory took a nosedive. Well, quite literally. my explanation has been is this unlike brian danison she was just accepting the fact that you know she rolled over on her back and sh and raised up her belly showed her belly put up her hands and went okay i accept my fate brian danison on the other hand went okay you know what 
I love pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is what the fuck I do. I don't care about anything else. Yeah, I'm a farmer at home. Yeah, but pro wrestling is my number one love. I will never give it the fuck up. So he kept on working, kept on working, kept on working. Would not accept what he was told. Would not accept the fact that, hey, you have to retire. You know, you have a damaged neck. One more incident, you might be dead or you might be paralyzed. But he well, kept on here's, fucking going. Here's the subtle difference. I watched a little bit of the, the Total Divas behind the scenes stuff years ago. And there was a point mm-hmm. before he retired where Brian Danielson was in his uh, therapist or he was working with somebody. Maybe it was right before he retired. I'm not sure. And he and his wife were sitting there talking to somebody about what can you do? What skills do you have outside of wrestling? Oh, I started the Yes Movement. I'm the leader of the Yes Movement. I, I headline WrestleMania. He had no other skills. He's like, I only know wrestling. Wrestling is all I know. That is my life. Now, the difference is when he lost the ability to wrestle, yes, he became an announcer and a very good one because he is amazing on the microphone. He also then stepped away for a while because he couldn't do what he loved. He wouldn't do anything. But he got himself back because wrestling was all he knew. Soraya was earning a shit ton of money on Twitch. Exactly. So she didn't have the same incentives to stay in ring shape the way Brian did. And as a result, the funny, amount of ring rust is significant because let's face it, Brian is the best wrestler in the world. Soraya was never the best wrestler in the world. She had, exactly. she didn't have as far to fall, but she was never as good. So let's right. just move on. We know that she needs work. She came out on top. They had a good segment. Hooray. All Mo- right. Moving so, on. Moving on. The next segment. Hey, now. This one hey, now. Hey, now. Classic. Whose show is this? This is the Elite Mark Order show. And I am an Elite Mark Order member. You are. But. I'm one of the founders. But. Damn it. You're right. But. <laughs> <laughs> but. I'm running the show. Anyways. All right. I, I don't don't get me wrong. I absolutely appreciate you. Appreciate your enthusiasm. But there's got to be one person in charge. There's got to be one captain. All right. All got right. It. Thank you. That's all. That, otherwise, I'm with you. Trust me. You'll run. You're you're gonna want you run one of these shows, and I'm gonna walk all over you. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So the next segment was one I absolutely like. We had a lot of conversation about it in the Discord. It's the House of Black. They came out. They did a pre you know, a pre recorded segment. Did their spooky ooky, which I love. I love the way they come across. Love the way they presented it. They started talking about the house rules. They have an open house, so they started playing into the name of the House of Black, and that works with the overall casino theme with all in, all out, double or nothing, all of that. So the house rules in the open house House of Black trios challenge which I thought was cool, but there's a little contention, so we'll go over it. Number one, 20 count, uh, 20 count for the ring out. Just like Ring of Honor, you don't get just a 10 count, but they're making it specific and they're making it different because they started the promo by saying these belts mean nothing. And so they're going to yep. rebuild them. And I, I love that. So 20, 20 count for the ring out. Why? You can't run away. You will have to face us. No rope breaks because man must know pain. Oh, I love this. This is right up my alley. So no rope breaks, no ring outs, really. And the last part was the optional disqualification. And what Julia Hart said was disqualification is enforced dealer's choice. You decide what the rule is. Why? Because it's balanced. And I was like, oh, what? She went Thanos as all things must be. So they talk about the, the, you decide what a disqualification is. So I'm thinking black mist. That's the first thing I would get rid of, right? That's how they win all these matches. So I think that brings a really unique thing because they're going to prove even when you get to decide a way to win the match, we're still going to beat you. So I like this. 
giving them the chance to be dominant, I don't like the results of the match after this. But we'll talk about I'm that. In a with you. We'll talk about that in a second. What did you think about this this little pre program or pre uh, recorded package segment? It was fantastic. I mean, it's giving new life to House of Black. You know, it's actually showcased them on TV, you know, and they're giving a new side to the trio title. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, the trio titles would be like, oh, yeah, hey, let's uh, let, let's throw, like, some random team up against the champions. Yeah, they're still going to be doing that, but at least there's now different rules. And if memory doesn't serve me, I do believe that New Japan Pro Wrestling actually does initiate a, ton- a uh, 20 count as well. Yeah, it's, so it's not unheard of. There. Yeah, it's not unheard of at all. And but, I think that probably comes in the influence of, you know, Brody King has wrestled a handful mm-hmm. of times in New Japan. So that's probably where the heck he got the influence from. Maybe he's like, you know, hey, rather than just like, you know, 10 count, why don't we do a 20 count? You know, probably talking to everyone else beforehand. Yeah, there's a huge, I mean, obviously there's a huge Japanese influence in the entire company. So I don't think it's any stretch of the imagination that somebody who's right. worked in Japan was like, here's an idea. Because they clearly workshopped this. They came up with something like, how can we be different? So right. I think it's great. Uh, it gives a unique spin. And number one, any three wrestlers. We don't care. There's no rankings. This is open. Three people come together. Challenge us. We dare you. Mm-hmm. Oh, hell yeah. Step up. Bring it. That's what I'm talking about. Do this every week. I don't care if it's Rampage. I don't care if it's Dynamite. Well, collision whatever the show is just have them on tv have them just ruining three guys dominant Mm -hmm. because that's what will bring this championship to the level they want it to be because as much as the young bucks and the elite were a great team and they had good matches and i think the best of seven was a great way to kick off the trios there was a tarnish and it was brawl out and I think this will help reestablish it. I'm in agreement with you, big time. And you, know, and it, you know, if Jay were here, he'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm in agreement with you guys. You know, I love the Elite, but the ratings have been shit, and they have been, unfortunately. For the hour when they're doing the trios matches, they're usually shit because people aren't interested. This should hopefully bring in some interest. Yeah, hopefully absolutely. Will be, but I don't know. I, I, think, I think this is, they were left off TV a little bit to build this plot line and i like it and i think they've they've communicated well i think i think malachi now has the ear of tony or whoever's on booking to be able to get things approved where he can really lean into his his very dramatic style so i want him to keep this up and hopefully they can build some momentum keep some momentum and get those trios titles over now, speaking yep. of trios, the very next segment was the Trios Battle Royale. The uh, the 3rd of May, the Tres de Mayo, instead of Cinco de Mayo, which I thought was dumb. Um, but it was the big Battle Royale, <clears throat> and there were a lot of people in it. I don't want to go over it, because we know there was a whole lot of people. Ultimately, it came down to John Silver, the Basically, it was the full acclaimed and Billy Gunn uh, and Butcher Blade, Kip Sabian, who now apparently have some team name. The gallery? Yeah, I'm not sure about that one, but okay. Uh, They're a good trio. Uh, Butcher and Blade are great. Kip Sabian adds a good flavor. I like having them. And then her and uh, Penelope and Bunny. They're a good match. So I think it's actually a good five-person team. So keep that up. Um, mm-hmm. They had some good segments. They were the final bad guy bosses. Ultimately, Billy Gunn and it wasn't Max Caster. Max Caster got uh, got let go. It was, it was Bowens who got the, uh, the finish with Billy Gunn. And they had a really cool spot where Bowens went over the top rope, but he was holding with one hand. Billy Gunn came over and helped him. And Taz tried to uh, explain it. That's from all the scissoring, which was just comedic. But the fact that he even added that in, added to the overall sell of the move, or, of the move yep. and the and the match. So uh, at the end, the acclaimed won. They now get to go on and face the House of Black. How'd you feel about the match? Were there any spots that stood out to you? 
think the I think it was just as a whole, like, you know, the typical battle royal, you know, everybody, they wanted to get people in and out, have, like, a lot of people in there, you know, toss them out and all this other shit. Battle royals in some cases, some of them kind of, you know, don't stand out. A lot of them, do, some of them do. But I didn't, I don't want to see the acclaimed up against it because now it's just, okay, so who are you going to put the titles on? Who's going to win? I want House of Black to retain. I don't want to see the acclaimed, you know, lose this match. So they could have honestly gone with Dark Order, which, and even then, I have said this like a handful of times, I hate the fucking fact that the Dark Order has now been relegated to being the best friends of Hangman Page that E will sometimes remember and sometimes acknowledge, hey, yeah, you guys exist, I forgot about you, okay, uh, I'm gonna go over here and, uh, cuck for the Elite, because, you know, they were the guys that got me famous, so I'll see you guys later, go fuck off. But yeah. Maybe you guys, maybe it could have been Hobbs, QT, and solo the no. or maybe butcher blade yes and Kit, the gallery because i want to see the butcher against big brody king that is a hoss match that i want to see yeah and it's a good they are a good enough trios team that they will go after house of black guaranteed i'm hoping they'll look good and i agree i'd love to see butcher against brody i think that's a great hoss match uh butcher has worked really really hard uh, to become a good professional wrestler over the last three, four years. Now, uh, I do want to go back over real quick before you continue with the reason why I said Hobbs, QT, and Solo. Mm -hmm. At that match, you know, they lose. Hobbs doesn't take the loss. He doesn't. He's not the one that gets pinned. Either QT or Aaron Solo gets pinned, and then Hobbs gets pissed off, beats both of them shitless, and then leaves them. See, unfortunately, unfortunately, them. we know that's not going to happen. I wish it would. We all Hob do. Hobbs, we don't want to see TV. Hobbs was building some momentum with the Book of Hobbs, with his build up in the Wardlow thing, and it just came to a screeching fucking halt when they put him on with QT. So, because QT's a real leech, honestly, I, I, I don't care what anyone says. I love when Hecky uh, and Raj Gary got in their fight, but he's a fucking leech. He's not. He just. I don't. It's not working, and I don't want Hobbs associated with solo and qt that's Agreed. all i just i don't want him to be associated with those guys because he's he, they're dragging him down um but that i'm a hobbs fan <clears throat> i have Same been here. since he showed up in day one and started helping john moxley that's how much uh, trust they had in hobbs it was the beginning of the pandemic and they were like let's bring in you know some of these other people they brought in hobbs and he was immediately in a program with moxley no, he wasn't quite there. He was still real green. So they built him up since then. But damn, I've been a fan since the first day I saw that big dude. And I thought, he's a big motherfucker. Um, <laughs> but he's just, I want him on his own. He's better on his own to build and, and build himself that way. I don't think QT's doing him any fucking good. Nope, not at all. So the next segment they talked about uh, was another Max MJF segment, uh, Max uh, Sammy segment, where they were talking about the upcoming, and they're like, you know, you you left me behind, and then MJF had his his line about I I hurt my back carrying the company, I had to go lay down, and he had the little cry face, and Sammy turned him around, he's like Max, and he grabbed him, and right at that second, Max froze. And he had an evil grin, and then he turned around and it was gone. If you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't see it, but it was there. I was like, oh, man. And, of course, at the end, you know, Sammy kissed him in the forehead a bunch. And we know Sammy knows because Tay confronted him that, that Max is going to try to screw him. Ultimately, we know it's four on four. By the end of the match, they did get into it. So the fact is... This interplay was great. It showed that Sammy can keep up with Max. It showed that he is still top of the card talent. Unlike Jungle Boy, who wasn't able to keep up. So this was great over the top. I love this version of Sammy. Keep him around. He's great. Anything to say about this segment? It was fun. That's for sure. It was strange because, you know, I really don't know what to make of this. I mean, they're becoming, uh, I can't really explain it. It is hilarious, you know, see him randomly kiss uh, MJF on the head and MJF, like, not care. But I'm looking back on their Twitter because I've been looking at their Twitter throughout this whole thing. And I can see, I can see the smirk 
the evil grin on MJF's face as he's being grabbed, as his mm -hmm. wrist is being grabbed by Sammy Guevara. Mm -hmm. Before, you know, he gets turned around and, get, and kissed on the fucking forehead. Mm -hmm. And they go, friends, let's shake hands. Friends, hug! It, that whole yeah, thing. The friends hug. I swear to God, if they don't come out with a chibi shirt with Max and Sammy chibi hugging and it says friends hug. If they don't come out with that shirt, I swear to God, I'm going to bootleg it. <laughs> it. It makes me, honestly, it gave me Jericho and MJF yeah. vibes, you know, yeah. from uh, 2019 and 2020, Literally. you know, when everything they were doing, it made me think about that. You know, it also whole, reminded me of Jericho Sammy with the lay sex gods where they did the big smile next to each other. It's totally the same sort of vibe and feel. Absolutely. Right. And and that's on purpose. And it's good. It's entertaining. I love it. More of this. It's a little goofy. It's a little funny. And once again, Max has a totally different persona for this buildup for this pay-per-view. He has had a different persona for everybody he's faced. This dude is amazing. And people still do not believe that he's a great modern day healer. They're still sitting there going, oh, it's Roman Reigns. Yeah, Roman Reigns is nothing. No, here's the I'm thing. Sorry. Roman Reigns is not nothing. He is a big dude. He is yeah. very charismatic. He, he is. He is. He's carried by his family and Paul Heyman. He has learned to talk and has learned to utilize the... Look, I'm not going to sit here and defend Roman Reigns. They pushed him and 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 they pushed him. And, pushed him. and finally something worked. That's it. Only That's all. Paul Heyman. <laughs> That's all that when he turned heel and they brought in Paul Heyman and they stopped suffering succotash promos. They finally found something that worked and they won't let go. But that is a totally different company. What I want right. to talk about is a good company. And the next segment after Max and Sammy was Kenny Omega cutting a promo with Don Callis in re in response to the BCC from earlier. Now, some people have a problem with Kenny Omega because he played it very calm, very subtle, very underplayed. I saw a quiet smoldering, but like he was building his anger a little bit, but maybe I read more into it than other people. Uh, Don Callis, of course, fantastic talker, built up the match. I think it's going to be amazing, and I think that Kenny, if it were, as he said, if it were a straight wrestling match, he'd be able to beat Moxley. Everybody knows that. But in the cage, it's a different beast. So I just, I, I, I think this is going to be fantastic. They built it up amazing. I don't know what more to say about the segment. I completely and totally agree with you, big time. Yep, this is why we love these guys. This is why he's top of the card. And this is why his match with the BCC is going to be fucking amazing. Yep. Speaking of agreement. speaking of amazing, the opposite. Uh, Wardlow with Arn beat up. You 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 said his name was La uh, Logan Larue. Apparently, he's not related to Lash Larue from WCW. Um, yep. it, it was not a match. It wasn't even a squash. It was a couple of moves. Uh, it was a massacre. Yeah, it was. Typical Wardlow, come out, squash match. And that's just not as entertaining. Tony, for whatever reason, him or his booking committee or whatever, have difficulty booking a big, strong, dominant face. They can't do big, strong, dominant heels because Lance Archer never works. But, yeah, they've tried with him so much and it's just, no. But there's something they just, they're, they're not able to get those big guys over for some reason. And and quite honestly, WWE is doing the exact same fucking thing with Omos. And it's not working. Yeah, Omos. <sighs> but totally different. Wardlow also has Arn Anderson with him. So I'm excited to see them do some four horsemen shit. So... At the end of the squash match, Christian comes out with, with uh, Luchasaurus in tow, starts talking the game, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And then the big surprise. Oh, no, the title match isn't for me. Or the title match isn't for him. It's for me. So it's Christian versus Wardlow, which is a better matchup, honestly. 
because Agreed. Luchasaurus still isn't quite there, and another Haas versus Haas match, those can those can have trouble in AEW. There could be some good ones. There could be some real dogs. So uh, I'm glad to see Christian, who is really good in the ring, who's going to be able to work with Wardlow and get a good match out of him. So I'm excited to see that more than a match with Luchasaurus at this point. Agreed. Big so, time. Good job on selling that. Now, the next segment. I will say, after this, two things. Number one, I never, ever thought I would genuinely enjoy Jeff Jarrett again. I I just didn't. And number two... I you were JJ for life. I mean, in real life, not my character. Obviously, right, right. obviously JJ for life, that goes without saying. But I've uh, J- Jeff Jarrett did some real fucked up shit for the last dozen years. Yeah, he fucked up some companies. He really, he really, really pissed some people off with his antics backstage. Yep. And so I really did not want to like him, and they have completely changed my mind. Now the first part, of course, was when he told. Uh, uh, Tony Khan, no, I don't want the International Cup Championship. I think Orange should continue. That gave a lot of respect for me. This next segment, I'm sold. I'm like, this is the best. This is the best Jeff Jarrett's looked in forever. Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh show up to the Briscoe Farm in overalls to work the farm. And I never thought I would be a Briscoe Brothers fan. After what Jay Briscoe said, after the the shit, all of that, I never thought I'd be a fan. Jay Briscoe unfortunately passes. I give Mark a pass because he didn't say the shit. He was just the brother. He's, He's fucking hysterical. He is so funny and genuinely funny. Like... He just, he stands up. He's like, we want to work the farm. Okay. Hands his baby straight to Satinum. Not a second word. Just hands it to the big dude and off they go. Just the whole presentation. I thought it was great. They showed him working the farm and manure. And, whoa. You know, they were crying because they were heels. But Mark Briscoe made him work the farm. And then at the end, you know, there was the thing where Jeff Jarrett was going to start singing because he's got the guitar I just thought overall the presentation of being on the farm, it was great. It, it made me, re- I really enjoyed the segment. It was funny. It was fun. It was goofy. At the very end, his dad comes up, the Briscoe dad comes up and they sort of scurry away and give their respects. And he's like, you got to be careful of them, you know, in the overalls, like which one? Both of them. There was three of them in overalls. Just the funniest thing. But it was obvious that that Mark knew what was happening because at the very end, Jeff Jarrett got him, wrangled him in. And was like, hey, you beat FTR. What did you do to beat him? And Mark went, oh, so that's what this is about. So, again, not everybody caught that. But that whole segment was them trying to get in his head because he's just some dumb chicken farmer. But he's smarter much smarter than they gave him credit for. I love this character. I did not ever expect to like any Briscoe. I love Mark Briscoe. I think this is the best angle. I think this is a great tag angle. Jeff Jarrett, Jay Lethal are a fantastic team. They've got Sanjay Dutt on their side. They've got Satnam Singh as their heater. Absolutely could win the tag titles. I don't imagine they will. But the build-up to this match has been fantastic. And in this one segment, they gave me every reason to be invested in the tag match. What did you think? Well, I'm in agreement. It's a hilarious segment. And I won't comment on the Jay Briscoe thing. I mean, what he did say was fucked up. It was bad, you know. But he did end up getting a lot of respect from various different LGBTQ wrestlers. A lot of them came out and, you know, said, hey, you know, I love Mark, you know. I do believe it was Maxine Paler that said that they had actually they, they would actually rush over when they were in ROH and the Briscoes were on, they would rush over to watch his match, to watch the Briscoes matches. 
that says it everything. He I, went from you know. I understand. He said was bad. I understand, but the the again, my personal feelings aside, doesn't matter. Jay is no longer with us, and therefore it is a moot point, and I've forgiven Mark of all of it. So I came in with a blank slate. That's what I'm saying. Regardless, right. we know Jay's history. That's not relevant, is my point anymore, because. I mean, let's face it, that association was stopped the really worst way possible. Yeah. But as a result, Mark is getting himself a bit of a career. And I love that for him. Right. Because he's genuinely, you could see there's a lot of sincerity in him. I think his move set is funny. I think his expressions are funny. I, I, I see why people are fans. That's what I'm saying. I see why Agreed. people were fans for so many years. I couldn't because of the issues, but I, I get it now. Damn, do I get it now. Um, so yeah. the chicken farm, they, they, they got to do two or three more of those. A anything, anything with, with Mark Briscoe backstage where they're trying to woo him, I think is fucking gold. Just keep that going, please. Agreed. Well, uh, anyways... I'll uh I'll get my uh, opinion on the segments. Yeah, I got right into the more controversial thing on there, but uh, anyways, I'm in agreement. It was hilarious. Okay. You know, they came to work, sat him, got handed mm -hmm. baby, so he, now he's a babysitter. Jeff Jarrett's gonna sing the uh you know the song that he'd actually sing, along with my baby tonight. Yep. And then Papa Frisco walks up, stops them, and you know they walk off. They scurry away like the typical heels they are. And he looks at him, he's like Chicky, which is what he calls. He mm -hmm. always called Mark Briscoe, as far as I know, Chicky. I'm and sure it's like, real. No. Yeah, he's like, you gotta be careful of them, you know, don't trust them. It's like, watch the idiot overalls. Which one? Both of them! And I'm looking at the video, the only one I actually see, like, really in overalls, the only two are exactly Satnam Singh and Sanjay Dutt, the two biggest ones that always get involved in every Jeff Jarrett Jay Lethal tag match. Those two are the biggest ones. I'm thinking that's who he's referring to because Jeff Jarrett's wearing jeans. That I knew. I thought I thought that Jay Lethal also had overalls on. No, he didn't. Uh, he had like on a regular old. He had on you know cut jeans. Okay. And a white t-shirt that has you know all of them on it. You know, Satnam, him, yeah. Jeff Jarrett's, and, and Mark in the else. corner. Yeah, and then his jacket, and he also had okay. like on a, like a blue jacket. So well, I I do know that Satnam and and. Uh... And what's his name? Uh, and Sanjay Dett were, Sanjay, all, were yeah. both in overall. Yeah, they they were, and it was comical because they were they were. It's the epitome of I'm going to try to ingratiate myself with you in the most stereotypical kind of uh, just looking down, you know, condescending way possible. And yeah. it's just it was it was fantastic. Love the segment. Um, so it's got me sold. I'm ready for it. The next part, Agreed. the next segment, I was not ready for. I was, this is, this is the most mid fucking feud. And it's Ricky Starks versus Juice Robinson with Jay White. Now I thought Ricky was going to take the loss because Juice absolutely needs to have some build up to his character. I thought Jay was going to stay ringside. They were going to have shenanigans and it was going to cost Ricky the match. That did not happen. Jay stayed behind. Therefore, it was a one-on-one -on -one with Ricky versus Juice with no outside interference. Thus, Ricky won. There was still the, the after-match beatdown. There was still, you know, the chance for Ricky to do his thing um, and for Jay White to get in trouble so that Juice could save him. Ultimately, it's going to be Jay White versus Ricky Starks at Double or Nothing. But I'm sorry, this is not helping. Jay White did not come across super well. I mean, he didn't come across terrible, but he's just not coming across as a star. Juice is getting better. I'm starting to buy into his character a little bit. He just, he needs some help. He needs some wins. And Ricky Starks lost the fire. There was a time a couple of months ago, everybody loved Starks. Everything he said popped the crowd. What happened? Where'd it go? So the match was fine. This is just mid. I'm okay with it, but meh. You know? 
Right. Yeah. What'd you think? Well, me and my dad have actually talked about this because my dad's like, yeah, I'm not really the biggest Ricky Starks fan. He was a little bit irritated. He lo- he uh, won, and I asked him, I was like, why? He's like, because he thinks he's the Rock. He loves to act like he's the Rock. I'm like, kind of. I do have to agree with that. He's trying really hard to be like Dwayne Johnson, and it doesn't work. I mean, there's been one Rock, dude. You got to get your own shit. That I, I think that's his clothing, though. That's his clothing. The way he dresses, everybody thinks of the Rock. Because he does the big right. open shirt with the gold necklace, even though that is a style many people have used, including right. Scott Hall, of, including right. Scott but Hall. A lot of, right, but a lot of wrestling fans always associate like you know nice dress. They always associate that nice dress people. You know, here's the thing: it's Dwayne Johnson. It's the Rock. I a hundred percent got the comparison to the Rock from day one. I don't know what it is about that kid, but he one hundred percent tries to evoke the rock even though he does different stuff almost entirely there's something about him in a positive way i think that evokes the rock that everybody picks up on even if he doesn't do it intentionally well like this is something that i have uh, seen before so well, this is actually something that i watched in a video of Dolph ziggler you know with an interview he did with chris van Vliet. he's like you know when i was in ovw the reason why you know, i dyed my hair the color I did and, you know, I was wearing the trunks that I was wearing is because everybody was trying to be like Randy Orton. You know, Orton's mm-hmm. out there being a badass. He's got his black hair. He's got his black trunks, his black boots. And everybody in, o- in OVW was copying it. And that's a lot of wrestlers. A True. lot of the young wrestlers, they cannot get over on their own, so they have to copy somebody else. Absolutely. Ricky Starks is over, but he's doing a lot of things like The Rock. You know, he's got the whole, I'm this big, huge mega star. You know, like, I'm so far in. I'm like... Ricky, you're only he, in wrestling. He you presents were unknown prior. He presents himself as bigger than he is, which is an absolute necessity as a wrestler. Right. But honestly, I think it was the haircut. When he first it's showed up, when he first showed up, he had the Rocky Maivia hair. That's that's yep. the only thing I can assume. That and the fact that he also is mixed race. So somehow that immediately made that association, which is weird because there's plenty of other mixed race people in that entire company. But there's something about Ricky that, again, it's his image, it's his style, it's the way he presents himself. It absolutely evokes the rock. And, exactly. That's what a lot of people don't like. And even if they can't articulate it, they call him Rock Jr., they call him Pebble. MJF called him Pebble. That comparison has been made for a long time for good reason. So, and it's never going to end. It, it will if he can get his own personality. And, and it doesn't seem like that's going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately. Dude's like 26, 27. Give him a break. He's got lots of time to get hey, MJF better. has his own personality. Look, and MJF, MJF is a once-in-a-lifetime generational talent. Agreed. Okay, you cannot compare MJF to Ricky Starks. They may be similar. But they're not comparable. Yeah, they may be around the same age, but they're not comparable. I would not agree at all. With you, on that. you just you cannot compare a thoroughbred racehorse, or let's put it to you this way: you cannot compare Apollo Creed to Rocky. Until Rocky wins, you just cannot compare them. Right. All right. So that's really the end of the show. Because the very next segment was MJF going backstage talking to Jack Perry. And then Jungle Boy coming in, and then su- or no, talking to Jungle Boy, and then Darby coming in, and then suddenly no longer trust Jungle Boy, and that showed up in the match where they where uh, Darby won up them the entire time, up into and including the end, and then it was a four way. So it was a great show overall. I enjoyed it. I know it's not the strongest, but it doesn't matter because it's consistent. They're having amazing matches on TV. They're going to have one of the biggest shows that Europe has ever seen. Even if they don't beat the record of 92,000 people at Wembley, they're going to have one of the biggest shows that Europe has ever seen. Tony Khan has taken a huge leap of faith in, in trying, not trying, in booking Wembley, much like they first did with ROH. Hey, could they sell out a 10,000-seat arena? They sure could. Hey, 
because they saw it a 90,000 seater uh, stadium. Turns out, yes, they could. I'm so happy that this company exists and I'm happy for the direction it's going. Are there problems? Of course. Are there things that we can work out or that they can work out in the long run? I absolutely hope so. People like Punk coming back can only help if done correctly. So hopefully, I totally agree. Hopefully we can see more boom because the better AEW does, the better it is for the entire industry. AEW has a huge event in Europe. There are so many independents in Europe that are going to feed for that entire week and get exposure and have shows and make new fans. That's going to be such huge business for the entire business, as well as AEW, as well as the entire country for London, for the entire area where it's being held. It's sold out already. All of the hotels are done. So this is conceivably the equal to WrestleMania. That is actually what Jeff Jarrett said. Apparently, I think he said it was Tony Khan and a lot of other people have said that this is going to be the UK's version of WrestleMania. And I cannot agree. I cannot disagree. I'm, I'm not even no going to say I can disagree. I'm not even going to say the UK's version. I'm going to say AEW's version. I think this first one in the UK is a massive statement. I don't think it's going to be like that every year. But I do think that they're all, by the way, we don't even know how we're going to watch it. Nobody has any idea how they're going to watch it. Nobody has any idea how what's going to be on this card. No matches at all have even been thought of. There's three and a half months between now and the end of August. And three pay-per-views, or two pay-per-views. Double or nothing and... Forbidden Door. Forbidden Door. And then after it immediately is all out. So this next summer is make or break. AEW is either going to put their foot down so hard that the impression will be undeniable. They're going to go from undesirable to undeniable. Cody, thank you for that line, but fuck you. <laughs> I, cannot I cannot agree with you more on that one. Fuck you, Cody Rhodes. Go to hell. I mean, realistically, he he could have stayed, renegotiated, worked something to where it worked better for him. He went back to WWE, probably not for the money, but for his own ego. I, I, I know you, you definitely have, have made your opinion known on that. There's no question what you feel about Cody. But for me, I see it as, yeah, they're selling it as, oh, I wanted to finish the story, this, that, and the other thing. For me, it's always been the pressure was too much. Being a vice president, having you know, being an EVP, having those extra responsibilities, the other TV shows, all of the different stuff he was expected to do in addition to being a wrestler was too much for him. And that's why he went back to being just a wrestler. He doesn't have to think of promos. He doesn't have to think of anything. He can. He can put a lot of work into different stuff. He can work on designs and all the things they want their wrestlers to be involved with. But what he doesn't have to worry about anymore is any of the backstage stuff. He comes in, he wrestles, he's done. Right. And that's huge. You, you're, you're young. I don't know if you've run a business before. I have not. But when the only you... thing I've really done is landscaping. So. <laughs> well, it's 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 it, landscaping is no joke, but it's it's a whole different world when you're the one holding the bag, when you're the one responsible from top to bottom for everything being done, and if it doesn't get done, you're the one who didn't do it. And and in his case, he was in a bigger company, bigger corporation with somebody, Tony Khan, who's used to working at that level and knew what to expect. He knew what his EVPs were going to do. And Matt and Nick cover selling 
and they they built up a team and they're able to do it. They're doing their job as EVPs well. Kenny got into the video game section. And as far as we know, he did well, other than being too verbal for a company that apparently doesn't want to promote the game. Right. But Cody was just overwhelmed. He wasn't able to keep up with all those responsibilities that he craved. And I know because I've done it. I've gone into businesses and I craved all of that. And I'm like, give it to me. I'll run this. I'll run that. I'll be head of this. I'll run this team. I'll run that team. You run yourself fucking crazy. And after a while, I was like, yeah, guess what? I'm not a juggler and everything crashes to the ground. Not always a good look. So I kind of understand what happened with Cody. He probably got uh, overwhelmed and good for him that he recognized it and got out before he ruined AEW. Agreed. Right. So he ran away. He went somewhere that he felt that he was more protected. He realistically he did what wrestlers do he went to the competition he jumped territories that's not a big deal he did that originally when he left wwe the reason he left wwe was to rebuild his name and image to go back to wwe so people who were upset that he went back to wwe weren't paying attention to the story from the beginning but i just haven't been a fan of him for so long because of you know all his normal boring shit that he does so yeah well you i mean you've you've expressed it many times in the chat room you've expressed it you know on the podcast you 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 feel he's he's egocentric which he is that that all he's doing is he absolutely is and and he craves the spotlight and this that and the other thing and and you're not wrong in what you dislike him for i just Look, first of all, he's in WWE. I don't have to watch him anymore. It doesn't give a fuck. It doesn't bother me. I get to watch the good show. Um, exactly. The fact is, I think it's bad for him that he wasn't able to handle it. Now, will he be able to go back one day? Sure. I bet Tony Khan would love to have him back as a wrestler. But he decided he wanted to go. He couldn't get, you know what? Just coming back after multiple years away wasn't enough adversity. They needed a year of humiliation before they put the title on him. Yeah, no. Sorry. He's a jackwad. He gets what he deserves. Okay, I think we're done. I think we're going to go ahead and end it here. Krill, I appreciate your time. You you no filled problem, in fa- you filled in fantastically. Uh, for those of you Even who... Even if are... I interrupt you many times. You're good at it. For those of you who are still listening, we appreciate you. Go ahead and join us at the EliteMarkOrder.com. Join us in the Discord. Hit comments both down below. Like, subscribe, share, do all the things. We love you, and you know the password. JJ for NBA life. NBAK for life. <laughs> NBAK.